Are you dealing with stress? Do you sometimes just feel down, unable to get up early in the morning or whatever time you do get up? Are you just almost at a point of depression and just uncertain what life is about? Bronwyn Schweigert has an interesting approach to how to work with stress to relieve that stress. She has a series of podcasts on this. Hi there, and thank you for joining us on the Overcomers Overcoming podcast. We feature those who are in the process of overcoming or have overcome any type of life encounter, life obstacle that at the time seemed to be almost insurmountable. With this podcast, we have three objectives in mind. Our first objective is we want you to know with a confident resolve you are not alone. We want to work with you. We want you to know there are others who are working with you, who want to help you through whatever you are encountering. And together, we will get through whatever you're experiencing. Our second objective is there are multiple options for any life encounter you are facing. We want to help you develop a resolve that there are various options and solutions to any life dilemma. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you're encountering something that was possibly a decision you made sometime in the past, and if you had the opportunity for a life redo, you would make a different decision. We want to help you with those critical thinking skills that can help you make an informed decision and not encounter what you're going through at the moment. We are the Cooper Culture, a veteran-owned business. We work with business personnel and families to develop and sustain connected relationship cultures within their families and organizations. That type organization is one where people feel wanted, appreciated, and genuinely a part of that organization. I'm with my wife and business partner, Marty, who has helped me facilitate this podcast. Today we feature Bronwyn Schweigert, who discusses with us stress relief. Stress can be caused in various forms, various topics, grief, worrying about debt, finances, any number of things. But she talks with us about non-medicinal approaches to stress relief. And it's a very interesting uh, podcast. And it's a very insightful one to help us get beyond stress. Marty, what are some takeaways our listeners can gain from Bronwyn? This was an interesting podcast in that your reaction to say something has happened and I walk into the office because something happened to me, I felt rejected or I felt like it wasn't right. You had nothing to do with it, but I snap when you say something to me. So the person that receives that snap should not feel that it's their fault. I snapped at them great opportunity to learn about stress relief. Let's listen and learn together. Bronwyn, it's good to have you with us. Uh, Our listeners are going to be very intrigued with your aspect and how you uh, work with people as a psychotherapist. And for our listeners, I I consider myself almost the antithesis of a psychotherapist by virtue of I'm a military guy and I'm an aerospace engineer by education and so forth, but I do like to work with people to help them reach their maximum potential. And I do know that sometimes our inner feelings um, and you know our negative inner feelings hold us back. And I think you have a lot to offer us in that context. But Bronwyn, it's good to have you with us. Thank you. Well, you know, you keep saying you're the antithesis of a therapist. Marty or Ron, sorry. Uh, but but you're human. And that's the one thing we all have in common, no matter what we know about psychology, what we know about talking about feelings or how comfortable that is for us. We're all human and we all have the whole gamut of feelings and use the word negative. I don't really love that phrase negative because I see, you know, all feelings are there for a reason. They're there, they're there for a good reason. They're there to give us information to inform us, to give us wisdom in how we're going to act. Um, 
So there's no such thing as a negative feeling. There are negative ways to, you know, act out those feelings for sure. And I think that's, you know, my specialty is anger. And we, most of us associate anger with like exploding, blowing up, being violent, being verbally violent. But, you know, our anger, we can just also just feel our anger in our body. And I see anger as like the light on the dashboard of our car that says, hey, something's wrong. Check the engine. You know, something's off. Something needs repair. And so I see anger as just a warning sign to say, you know what? Something's wrong here. And let's take a look and let's bring about resolution. So I think we have to you know, kind of, that's why it's not negative, but, but it can be negative. Absolutely. And depending on our relationship to our anger. And here's where I'm going with the negative. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I heard a person say one time, my feelings are never wrong. And mm -hmm. I am a kind of person that, well, now I'm, I'm curious, do your feelings mm -hmm. align with fact or are you just feeling a way because of whatever the external factors are, which mm -hmm. don't necessarily align with fact? Yeah. And with I will, reality. Tell you, yeah. will tell you yeah. that my my approach to people is, well, let's talk about it. And I'm, mm -hmm. I want to spend most of my time listening. But anger. I know, Bron, Bronwyn, that a lot of times people are angry because, and is it helpful just to uh, release your anger by talking about it? Or is it, uh, how do we get rid of anger or can you? Yeah. So there's not like a, a one size fits all. Um, so yeah, for some people that anger is very valid in that situation. And I think that's a really good question that you're asking, Ron. For other people, it's not a good metric of reality at all because you know we all have triggers we all have triggers from our early childhood actually and so you know um the main trigger that i have found that humans tend to have are when we feel rejected you know by someone so that can be like like when someone gives us a silent treatment that can be when we feel excluded or not wanted or you know it can be a whole host of things um, or someone just not listening to us that feels like rejection um, so, you know, we, most of us have that, that trigger and it's really imperative that we, we feel it and we're aware of it. And we say, you know, if I feel rejected, cause let's say I'm talking to you right now, Ron, and maybe you're not making eye contact with me. Maybe you're looking over there and I'm feeling kind of rejected, right? I can, I can own that. And I can say, wow, to myself, I'm feeling triggered. Cause I'm feeling kind of like. I'm not a priority right now. Like I'm feeling kind of rejected by Ron because he's not looking at me. And I can, and I say, I can say to myself, is this based in reality right now? Or is this just my trigger being triggered? You know? And so that's really my, that's my responsibility to own my trigger in that situation. That's my responsibility to have that self-awareness and to kind of root into reality. But I do have to be aware of it. And if I'm not, if we're not aware, we can't be responsible. So if it's unconscious and you're looking away and I'm unconsciously feeling really angry, but I don't even know it's because I feel rejected in the moment that I have this trigger, then I might be passive aggressive to you. I might be like explosive, who knows? Um, or I might just stuff my anger down because I don't really have a relationship with you and I can't afford to you know, be angry with you. But that anger is going to seep out in my relationship with my spouse or with my children or with the people closest to me. So that that anger, you know, I have to be responsible for it and I have to be responsible with it. And the best way to be responsible with our feelings is to just know they're there, to be aware of them. And then I can say directly to you, you know, Ron, I really love having this conversation, but you keep looking away and I, I'm just wondering, like, is it me or is, are you like preoccupied with something? And I can just be like a grown up in the moment and just kind of name it, name what's going on. And then maybe you say, you know what, Bronwyn, I'm so sorry. I was really distracted. Cause like, I think we're having an earthquake and I, you know, whatever. And then I'm going to be like, oh, wow. Okay. I wasn't being rejected. I am important to run. Right. 
Or maybe you'll say, what are you talking about? I wasn't looking elsewhere and you're defending, right? And then I'm going to get angrier. So it really, the bottom line is that we have to be aware of what we're feeling. We have to name it. We have to be responsible in the moment. And that's going to look different with the person we're with. With some people, it's going to be being assertive. With some people, it's going to be having boundaries. Um, some people, it's just going to be asking a question like, hey, am I chopped liver? What's going on here? You know, so it really depends. No, thank you. I'm, I'm very intrigued with what you're saying. Feelings of rejection, yes, uh, they're, they're very real. In the context yeah. of the person who might say, my feelings are never wrong. And I would say, okay, you, you I, I don't doubt you do feel rejected, but then it seems you're saying, uh, well, talk about it, uh, discuss it between you. I feel rejected I, because this is what I'm obser observing from you. Is yeah. it a matter of being that honest about, about, your feeling. And I guess I'm asking it in inherent in the question is I've got to feel confident enough in myself that I can even do that. Yeah. And that is going to be, again, this is all just dependent on the situation, on the context, on the person. So let's say you're my boss and, you know, I'm seeing a pattern with you where I, I just feel dismissed by you when I bring things up and there's a pattern, you know? So at some point, I'm going to need to address that pattern if we're going to have like a good rapport and a working relationship. And if I don't address it, I'm going to bring home all this suppressed anger in my body with me again, back to my loved ones at home. It's going to leak out. So I need to figure out a way to be responsible with my anger, not suppressing it with my boss. Now, some bosses are safe people to bring these things up with. Some bosses, you can say, hey, boss, you know what? this keeps happening and um, I'm not feeling heard by you. Some bosses are not safe people to ever have that conversation with. They're going to, they're going to defend, they're going to attack, they're going to throw us under the bus. So it really depends. Um, in that case, I could channel my anger out of my body in a responsible way by going above the boss, maybe and seeking accountability above the boss, because it would be counterproductive to confront someone who's not a safe person versus a safe person, right? Yes. One of the things Marty and I advocate with our practice is working with leaders to create a psychologically safe environment or culture. One, and I'll define that, Bronwyn, in my terms, being psychologically safe is I can express my feelings with you and I'm hoping you don't come back with some kind of a, maybe a smart aleck comment. Oh, mm -hmm. Ron, come on, get over yourself. Well, I mean, there are plenty of those people who do that. And that's something I talk a lot of. So I talk about all this on my own podcast, which is called Angry at the Right Things. But I talk about that um, as well, like confronting someone who's not a safe person or dealing with someone who's not a safe person because they're everywhere. Um, and we can't just you know, isolate ourselves from everyone who's unsafe or else we'd never leave our house, right? Or maybe we would leave our house too. <laughs> um, but but we can just say, you know, um, let's say like you're suggesting that um, I said, come on, Ron, whatever, you know, or this person said that to you, come on, get over yourself. Then I would say, well, what I would do is be a mirror. So with unsafe people, or any people for that matter, you can be a mirror. And a mirror isn't attacking that person. It's not aggressive. It's just giving them a true reflection of what they're doing. It's not engaging with that person, like arguing. It's not that. It's almost like you're detached, have this healthy detachment. Like you're kind of a fly on the ceiling, looking down, having this healthy objectivity. And you just name what's going on. So I would say, wow you know, I'm trying to express my feelings to you. And it seems like you're not willing to hear them right now. Like I'm hearing a lot of defensiveness. That must be really hard for you to hear my feelings. All right. So for the person, uh, and now I guess what I'm asking is for, for the person who just doesn't feel comfortable being that, I call it overtly honest and it's a, for me, it's a form of active listening as I'm uh, listening to you. 
but mm -hmm. that is okay i'm i'm interpreting what what our conversation is as you're looking beyond me you you don't seem to care uh, but you're expressing what you're interpreting of the person's reaction to me is is that what a, a part of what you're advocating is uh, do always be um let's say confident enough to express that way and just hey let's just make every make sure we put everything on the table well you, i don't know about always but um but yeah in general um so it is confidence and it also is what we call assertiveness and i think most people confuse aggressiveness and assertiveness and so you know let's say i'm talking to you and you cut me off mid sentence like it's not aggressive to to do this i could just say wow ron it, you just cut me off in mid sentence like i'm not i don't know what to say right now i'm just feeling kind of confused that's not an aggressive thing to say that's like an honest thing to say and i'm not attacking you i'm just like naming i'm narrating what just happened right no, I totally agree with you, uh, but I'm trying to project myself as the maybe low confident introvert who and doesn't have to necessarily mm -hmm. be an introvert, but at least you no, know, I wow, well, I don't feel that I'm that confident that I can let's say mirror back uh, what my feelings are that you may think something less of me. And so I maybe I don't even want to express that. I mean, am I expressing a very low confidence of a person who would even express it this way with you? Yeah. So it sounds like there's like fear about that person exploding. Maybe is that what you're getting at? Like that. Yes. Person, like, yes. Okay. Exactly. And okay. I, 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 I really, I, I, I just. If I'm the kind of person that oh, almost at all costs, I want to try to maintain civil relationship. And if yeah. I say anything that might might even someone may even consider controversial, uh, yes, I'm being assertive, but yet I I just don't want to create controversy. Well, let me ask you, Ron, are you the one creating it when you're naming what someone else is actually doing or are they the one creating it? by doing those things? No, that's uh, that's a very fair question. And, uh, but, but again, I'm trying to project for our listener and I'll say it at a very early age, um, I was a person, uh, I had, I was very low confidence and yeah. I just did not want to confront people. I didn't, did not want anyone to ask me for my opinion and so forth. I, yeah. at, at an earlier age, I would just avoid people because uh, you probably, you're probably going to disagree with me anyway. So l let's don't even engage in conversation. Okay. Well, I have a great response for you and everyone who is feeling represented by you. Um, here's rule number one, this big boundary, you know, you guys probably talk about boundaries from here, you know, here and there, there's this big invisible boundary in the world. And the most important one is that I am only responsible for my feelings. I am not responsible for your feelings. I am responsible to you, but I am never responsible for you or anyone else's feelings. So when I can really appropriate that and really understand that, that because a lot of us were raised we, we learned implicitly that we're responsible for mom and dad's feelings. We're responsible for them always being happy and never being angry. And, you know, when we implicitly, you know, take that in, that's something we have to unlearn as adults because we will be the most anxious adults. We will be codependent is what that is, is always trying to make everyone happy. Because when we do continue to feel responsible for other people's feelings, we cannot simultaneously be responsible for our own. It's an either or, it's a choice. And so what I tell my clients as a therapist is you can believe you're responsible for other people's feelings, but it's actually impossible and you will die trying. And so we can choose to only be responsible for our feelings and be responsible to others, but not for them. And so when I have really appropriated that, then I can have 
the confidence to be assertive and be that mirror to someone and say, Ron, I'm noticing this pattern of you cutting me off and I'm not comfortable with that. Because if you do explode, if you do attack, if whatever you do, those are your feelings, not mine. And I am not responsible for your anger. You are. No, that's very well said. I know there are some family cultures and we've spoken with uh, people who were raised this way that if you're, and not, well, no matter what your feelings are and what, if you're angry, whatever, we in this family just don't talk about it. Uh, you just go on about life and uh, come on, just, it, it's a, it seems a bit of get over yourself, but we in this family don't express ourselves that way. Just, mm -hmm. uh, just move on. And um, to those kind of people, I would say that, no, you're, uh, it would seem you might just be bottling up anger yeah. and you, you need an outlet and, and uh, don't, don't ever just bottle it up. That's my thought behind it. That's right. Because when we suppress our anger, you know, Freud is the one who first said depression is anger turned inward. And I can't think of a truer statement, um, but anxiety is also suppressed anger. So suppressed anger turns into depression, anxiety, even bipolar, like mania, psychosis. I mean, um, so it also turns into insomnia and difficulty sleeping and migraines and, and, you know, digestive disorders and all these phantom autoimmune disorders that no one knows where they come from. It, I mean, it makes us sick. Suppressed anger makes us sick. So I always like to say, you know, Anger is invisible. That is true. But truth be told, it is more real than this couch I'm sitting on right now. And it doesn't just evaporate into the ether. It stores up in our bodies and it makes us sick in some way. So it's really important that we express it. We externalize it out of our bodies in healthy ways. And that is just like being assertive, you know, bringing about that accountability, having boundaries. I was going to ask you or say to you, you were talking about, uh, I'm not responsible for your anger. I'm not responsible for your, your feelings. So for you, uh, for the person that says, I'm not responsible for your feelings, you're setting boundaries on, on yourself. Mm -hmm. Correct. I'm not going to yeah. let it bother me because you're the one having the prob problem or you're the one that's angry about something. Yeah. I mean, you can say it or you can just say it to yourself, but you know, I mean, it took me, I, you know, I'm in my fifties. It took me just to like a year or two ago when I was finally able to just let my dad be mad and be in his presence, be like, so sorry, so sorry. You're imploding right now. Not my problem. Did I say those things out loud? No, but I felt them and I felt totally fine. Just being like, uh, this is still the only way that we're going to be able to do this. And I just stood my ground because I didn't allow his red face to intimidate me. And I didn't back down because I just reminded myself, those are his feelings, not yours, Bronwyn. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you an opinion. I saw a video. It was actually just a few days ago of a group of women, and this is, I don't think it's gender specific. It just happened to be a videotape of a group of women who apparently had suppressed anger and they were in the woods. They were, uh, they each had sticks and on command, they were beating the stick on the ground, yelling and so forth. And I guess that was uh, that person's uh, method of psychotherapy to release <laughs> inner feelings. I, I, I don't know. To me, it just seemed bizarre, but I don't know. I guess uh, each to their own. Well, I would actually say, unfortunately, no, it doesn't actually work. Um, there, have you guys heard of rage rooms? I, I have not, but I can picture just the yeah. term, what it is. So you can pay to go to a rage room where they put all this, you know, safety goggles and whatever on you. And, and they give you all these like old computer related things to bash with like um, a golf club or a baseball bat. And it's like free therapy or not free it's therapy, but um, so studies show those don't actually work because 
they actually just, um, that anger, that rage at the time when you're expressing it, it just recruits more parts of the brain to be more angry actually. So it actually has a counterproductive uh, result. But, but, you know, what I have found is that just putting our feelings into words and I can do that in a fantasy letter that I write to, let's say my father, a fantasy letter. I'm not going to send him this letter. This is for me to say everything I I just really need to say, externalize it out of my body into words. So that's part one. Part two, I find someone who will listen and validate. So I can read that letter to them because it's not going to be him. That would be counterproductive. Now I'm going to be more angry because I'm feeling more unheard, but I can find like a friend or hopefully a good therapist. There's not a lot of those, unfortunately, but someone who's just angry with me and for me, someone who's not trying to talk me out of my anger, someone who's not like, well, Bronwyn, think about how he felt. No, someone who's just like, wow, I, I totally get why you feel that way. Someone who's just validating me. And when that happens, it actually calms the, the part of our brain, the limbic brain, because I feel heard. I feel understood. I don't feel alone in my anger. So what's shareable is bearable. And now that anger has dissipated out of my body and I'm good. I'm feeling great. No, that I appreciate what you just said. That so there is uh, some therapeutic value. I want to. I don't want to go into uh, being a therapist, but there is therapeutic value of just documenting your feelings and then find find. Uh, I guess I would call it an empathetic person who's willing to listen, and you just verbalize the words, your feelings. It's therapeutic to do that. Am I interpreting you correctly? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's hard to find those people because so many people, like my husband, for example, like he's still struggling. He's still on the learning curve here. Like he keeps saying, but if I validate your anger, then it's going to get worse. And I'm like, no, it will get better. It's so it is very counterintuitive. And I, 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 I will name that. It's so counterintuitive. So my anger actually diminishes when you validate it. It doesn't get, it might get bigger for like, you know, 30 seconds, but at the end, it's gone. Like I'm, it's out of my system. I feel completely better. And I'm finally able to go from my limbic brain into my prefrontal cortex and my logical part and go, well, now that I say that, I'm actually kind of, I am able to see his point of view. So now I can do that for myself. I don't need someone else to logic me. I need another human being to hear me and make me feel heard. So now I can enter my logic part of my brain and do the logicing on my own. I'm thinking of the listener who might be uh, somewhat similar to your husband, but let's just say they've had something occurred, who knows, 30, 50 years ago. And it just, it's in the, I call it the subconscious, but yeah. it is a matter of, okay, verbalizing maybe, and uh, do, you, do you go all the way back, that kind of thing, to uh, say, oh, yeah, let's, um, l let's, yeah. Uh, l let's release it? Oh, yes. And the reason it's still there is because we still have residual anger there. That's why we're stuck. That's why people get stuck, is there's still anger. So, yes, absolutely. I, you know, time is, you know, a construct, but... I'm all about time travel. I mean, let's go back and let's let little Ron finally say what he needed to say. You know, that's unfinished business and that's really important to do. Let's let little Ron finally speak what he needed to say in that moment in fantasy to his mom or his dad and finally get that validation from someone who is a safe person. Absolutely. I want to ask you, you know, sometimes you get angry and then you're sorry you got angry and you go, oh, why did I get angry over that? It was such a small matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you deal with how, how does a person deal with that? Well, that's probably from something that's a trigger. Mm -hmm. So again, like 
you know, that I would look, I would reflect on that. Um, take time to reflect. I'm not big into meditation, but I am into reflection. Like just taking time, we could be, you know, outside on a walk or whatever, but just taking time to like reflect on ourselves. Like, what was that all about? Why did I have that kind of reaction? Like, is this like a pattern for me? Is this something that's rooted in my early childhood? You know, what is this about? And and getting to know ourselves and getting to know our triggers and kind of owning those things. And what do I need in the moment when that, that shows up for me? You know, maybe I just need to reassure myself, like this, this is a different person. This person isn't ignoring you right now, even though it feels like it or, or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. We have a listener who listening to you is recalling something from some time in the past and they're saying now that you, uh, I'm going to use the word triggered or activated a thought. Yeah. Yep, yeah. It goes back to X decades ago. I just need to release that. Do you work with people, uh, let's say virtually or in person? How would you work with a person uh, to help them overcome any fears, anxieties, any pinup emotions? And I'm not, I'm not sure I'm using the terms you would use. That's fine. Um, yeah. So I would direct them to my podcast because that's actually why I produce it. It's my passion project to help people who are not my actual clients learn all of these principles. And so I also, I have a co-host. Her name is Katie. She's my best friend. And I actually do on Katie, I actually do the exercises I do on my clients. So the listeners can then do them for themselves at home. So there's some really simple exercises that I lead Katie in just so everyone can learn. So yeah, if someone has stuff from the past, I mean, we all have stuff from the past. Of course we do. So I, I lead people in like an integrate, I call it integration exercise. So their adult self um, recognizes and validates their, their young self when that happens. And it's really powerful. I have, I have seen people absolutely it's like i want to say they came back to life after the exercise but i would actually say they came to life maybe for the first time um after doing this exercise and i learned it because i did it for myself because i needed it so um it's so healing and i really believe that is that is the end goal it, to have mental health is to be integrated to be an integrated person to be whole, to be complete, where, you know, I'm 53 on the outside and I'm now finally 53 on the inside too, right? And where I'm integrated, where I'm not relating to myself the way my parents related to me. I've created a healthy, whole and healed relationship with my inner child. And so I'm, I'm healed now. What you just said is very important to um, yeah. to be healed of various feelings and so forth. For the listener who is intrigued and wants more information, um, can you give us the name of your podcast? Where would they find it? Yeah, you can find it wherever you subscribe, and it's called Angry at the Right Things. Angry at the Right Things. Now, do you, is there a, a, a subscription fee or no. how would, uh, okay. So you offer your therapeutic service uh, in the form of a podcast. And yeah. now um, would the listener get all the benefit they need from your podcast or uh, is there more to follow? I, I guess what I'm leading up to Bronwyn, would uh, a phone call visit anything of that nature? Um, well, I can only take people in, yeah, I take just certain insurance and only in the state of California. So it's, it's highly unlikely that I would, but yeah, I would say the podcast, I mean, so far, I think I have 17 episodes, which are all probably an hour long. So that's 17 hours of me talking basically, cause I don't interview other people. It's just me talking about all these principles. So I should hope that could help. 17 hours can help a lot of people go a long way. No, that's just great. Now I'm curious, 
of the 17 episodes that are nearly an hour long, do, yeah. does the listener need to listen to those podcasts in a specific sequence or no. are they entitled just pick the one that uh, best suits you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. Um, I think that I would just start with, you know, maybe the first one and just see where you go. Mm -hmm. Great. Bronwyn, you've got a great practice. Thank you for mm -hmm. offering your services to the listeners. And I do know what it is. Uh, some people with the, uh, uh, the suppressed pent up anger, whatever oh. term we want to put to it, we do need to release that and we need to have the right environment, the right people with the right empathy. And again, I, I'm using my own terms, but when you find that person, you can uh, become a whole person uh, and everything can can uh, return to a normal. And uh, again, I know I'm not necessarily using your terms, but I do know that uh, some people who have the pent up anger uh, can't sleep well. And it's, uh, there are a lot of things that are just churning in their mind. Yeah. I think we can all relate to that very human phenomenon. Yes. Thank you so much for everything you do, Bronwyn. And I want to encourage our listeners to look for your podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. We appreciate having the opportunity to share our and our guests' life's experiences with you. The Cooper Culture advances organizations to achieve and sustain high retention rates, connected communication, and trust through personality insights and principled leadership. You can contact us at our website, thecooperculture.com, and you can contact us directly at ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. We work with you to help assess aspects of your culture to advance the environment and people to their best performance. We do that through our staff of certified personal performance coaches, leadership trainers, keynote speakers, and disc personality behavior experts. You can book a speaking engagement directly through our website by contacting us at ron at thecooperculture.com. We look forward to sharing our life experiences with you, some of which are profound, some of which are pretty funny. Some of those life experiences are ones we'll never do that again because we've been through stuff. We truly look forward to working with you, speaking with you, helping advance you in any way that we can.